Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for the one of you uh, watching us live on, on, on the video stream on the internet. So my name is Sebastian. I'm a developer advocate or tech evangelist within uh, Amazon Web Services. I'm from Belgium, usually speak French. Maybe you have noticed that already, uh, slight accent that I have. Um, so my job is to talk with you folks at conference and to gather feedback about our services. We are talking very frequently with the, the, the product team. So let us know anything about AWS. We'll bring your feedback in. We are listening to our customer, and that's why we innovate. Talking about innovation, one of the key of innovation is about um, being able to deliver your, your application, your software, your feature really quickly. And one way to do that is through continuous integration and continuous deployment. Who is using any kind of CI, CD right now in the, in the room? Roughly one third of the room. Yeah, not even one third. Um, here I'm going to focus specifically on serverless application, like a function as a service or containers. So containers is not really serverless, but I will make a, the difference in, in, in a minute. So in Amazon, at Amazon, like almost 20 years ago, we had a big problem. We have this monolithic application talking to a relational database from a proprietary vendor. I guess you've been there. Maybe you are still there. And that prevents us to add some agility to and to, to release function for customers as fast as we would like. So we were like dragged off by this huge uh, monolith. So we decided to take a few steps and to break that monolith in microservices. So we make that change around 2001, 2002. And we, we broke our architecture in very small microservices. Now we have thousands of microservices. We have a huge map of all the dependencies between microservices. We call that the, the dead start. It, it looks really like a, a big black hole of all these services together. And we break our team in two pizza teams. So what is a two pizza team? It's, it's a small team because we realize that small, like seven, eight person teams are much more agile and, and they have less barrier of communication to build microservices. So the rule at Amazon, if, if you cannot feed your team with two pizza, American pizza, then the team is too large. You need to split the team and make it, make it smaller. And all of that allows us um, to have better ownership. Each team is fully owning the service. The rule at Amazon is you build it, you run it. So we, we are in full DevOps mode type of, of architecture and, and environment. Uh, it's the, the people that are writing the code that can be also beeped at 3 a.m. in the morning if something is broken. That's very efficient, because as a developer, if you are wake up at 3 a.m. in the morning for a ticket or something not working on your service, I can assure you that next day you're going to fix that and change your code in such a way that you can have a full night of sleep the week after. That allows us to focus on innovation by experimenting quickly, by giving, um, exposing our code towards customer and collecting feedback more quickly. It allows to uh, experiment more, test more. So we went from that to that. We had a lot of small teams contributing to different microservices. And one of the big problems that remained at that stage was how this independent team can release their code into production. How can, what type of tools can we give them so that uh, their code can efficiently, reliably, securely go into, into production? So what type of delivery pipeline are, are we going to give to this de developer? So we start to work on tools, and we build APIs, services, internal services, to give the power to the team to deploy their services to uh, production. And these are the exact same tools that we are now exposing to you, to our customers, so you can leverage more than 10 years of experience of Amazon as a, as a large entity to build, to release, to test, and to deploy your code into, into uh, production. So the release process, I guess you all saw that kind of, of graphs already. It's in every CI CD talk. You have the source, the build, the test, the production. Continuous integration is actually the first two phases. Manage your source code and build. Maybe part of build is some test already, like the unit test for, for your code. And then if you want to go a step faster, it's a continuous delivery or continuous deployment. The difference, continuous delivery, is you produce the artifact to be deployed later. Continuous deployment means you actually deploy the artifact into production. But you do that in a very safe way with the ability to control your deployment and to roll back, to come back if something goes wrong, to be able to undo your, your deployment. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples uh, how we, we are going to, to do that. There are three pillars to manage to have a full continuous integration and continuous delivery. 
infrastructure as code, continuous integration, and continuous delivery. So infrastructure as code, it's a new concept. It's, it's coming with the cloud, the public cloud, AWS, but other providers as well, where you define your infrastructure with code. I used to work in banks and governmental institutions in the last century. At that time, when we need a new testing environment, for example, we had to call the IT department saying, hey guys, uh, we need like 10 machines because we want to do a, a load testing before the, the big day of going to production. And these guys say, what, 10 machines? No way, we don't have that. Even a more agile department, the one running on VMware, said we don't have the capacity to do that. So what if you can just write a script, a couple of Python lines or JavaScript or Bash, and provision infrastructure dynamically, automatically in the cloud? That's infrastructure as code. Infrastructure as code is writing code to deploy infrastructure, to create a network, to create a database, to create a cluster. Imagine the power of that, because if you have that, it means that your data center is inside Git. You can version control your data center. You can see what changed, when, from who. Try to do that with physical server in racks and cables and, and power supplies that you need to, to manage by, by yourself. So the goal of infrastructure as code is to create repeatable infrastructure, something that is always the same. There is nothing worse in a data center than a snowflake server. What is a snowflake server? It's a server that looks unique, that looks, oh, sorry, it's a server that looks like it is configured as all the other servers in the data center, but actually it's unique, exactly like a snowflake. You know the snowflakes from distance, they all look the same, but if you look at them at the microscope, they are all different. And it happens all the time in, in really um, physical architecture because someone someday connects SSH on a production server to fix an urgent problem, you install a new package, you update a package, and suddenly, of course, you forgot to document that because it's 3 a.m. in the morning, you're in a rush, so suddenly that server is different than all the others. And when you deploy code on that server, it behaves a bit differently than all the others. And maybe it's just one server out of 10, and so maybe it's one of 10 customer requests that sometimes crash for whatever reason. You don't want to be there. You want all your infrastructure to be the same. So in the cloud, you just um, write a script, execute that script, and it cre creates infrastructure for you automatically. There are two different types of scripts to do that, imperative or declarative. In imperative, it's like a, a Python shell, a Python, a, a Node.js script where you declare the sequence of code that you want to, to, to build. Quite easy, uh, not easy to manage or to maintain because if you want to make a change to the infrastructure, you cannot really just, you need to write another script to do that. Or if you want to delete all the infrastructure, like at the end of a test, you need to write another script to, to do that. So the, the way we prefer is to do declarative. Um, you declare what you want. You say, hey, I want a network in two data centers. I want five servers there, five servers there. I want a load balancer there. I want a, a database. I want a replica for my database. And then you give that to a tool, and the tool will figure out all the dependencies for you. It will create all the service in the correct order for, for you. With that type of approach, you can also tell the tool, hey, can you delete the stack I just created? And you wait a few minutes and the stack is deleted. If you update your script, the tool is also able to detect the difference, the delta between your actual infrastructure and your script and just make the change. So we have different tools to do that. One of them is AWS CloudFormation. It's a quite low-level tool. It's it's there since around many years, like 10 years from now. Uh, I call that the assembly language of cloud. It's really down to the API. You need 400 lines of code just to create a network. But it works, and it serves hundreds of thousands of customers worldwide. But we have a new approach called CDK. It's in developer preview right now. The CDK is a cloud development kit, and the idea is to provide you with a high-level, object-oriented language to build your infrastructure. So you can write, and in, you can install the CDK. Um, it's an OGS application with just um, npm install, init your project, we have a command line, and we do support many different programming languages, TypeScript, C Sharp, Java, for example. Then you synthesize your, your, your infrastructure and you deploy that infrastructure. When you are done with that infrastructure, you just type CDK, destroy, and it will destroy the infrastructure. So a quick example of CDK. 
It's a, a cluster to run containers, so a cluster of machine where we are going to run containers that I'm going to use in my demo in 10 minutes. And uh, we create a network that's uh, the, the first line, the one which is highlighted right now, creates a, a network, so just one line of code to create a network across multiple data centers with public and private subnet, with routing tables, with gateway, with natting instance, all the complexity of, of a network. Uh, then you create a cluster of machine, virtual machine, to host your container and a load balancer to direct traffic to these containers. So you have what? like. 22 lines of JavaScript code that will generate hundreds of lines of cloud formation and creating that uh, infrastructure for you in, in the cloud automatically. You can run all type of AWS services, Lambda function, all type of infrastructure are supported by uh, CDK. So, infrastructure as code, that's the first part. A second part, continuous integration. Continuous integration is the idea of taking the source code produced by your developer and building that in a repeatable environment. Have always the same environment to build your code so that the, the code, the resulting code, is always the same. It's a set of zip files or jar files that are ready for, for deployment. Repeatable build, uh, that's one of the, of the key, um, but also a very frequent build, um, because you know that if you have 10 developers working in a branch, the, there is a very high probability that a change caused by one developer will break uh, something else uh, on the other side of your application. So detecting this type of change, this type of break, this type of errors, it's quite complicated if you do that once every six months, for example. It's much better and much easier to detect the, this type of change very quickly so to, that you can revert back and fix the problem very, very quickly. So ideally, you should have a, like an orchestration uh, system that will detect a change in your Git repository and trigger a build. There are many tools allowing you to build on AWS. You can use any of your favorite tools, so Jenkins, for example, on EC2. Uh, Jenkins, great. Uh, the problem if you run your own Jenkins in instance, it's you need to manage that EC2 instance. You need to manage the scalability of it, the availability of it, the backup of it. You need to install, to patch the operating system, to patch Jenkins itself. And this does not bring any added value to you. Everybody has to do that. So we have alternatives that are without any server. You don't need to manage any server, and that's code build. Code build is a service that you can use to build your application, any type of application, but we do manage the infrastructure. We do manage the scaling, the availability, the backup. You don't have to do that. You just provide us a script file to build your application, and that's, that's it. Once you have built your application, next step is to deploy your application. And of course, you don't want your deployment to break anything, so you need to do that in a way that you can monitor what's happening after your deployment and be able to come back if everything, if anything is, is, is not working. So deployment can be to staging, um, deployment can be to test environment, deployment can be as simple as one step, go to production. Okay, I'm doing that with my personal website, but okay, it's my personal website. If it is done for one day, nobody will complain, not even me. Uh, but maybe for your business, it's, it's not something that you can afford. So you are going to do uh, automatic steps to deploy into test, multiple environment, and only if all the tests are, are working correctly, then maybe submit an approval to a manager and have a manual deployment or a manual approval step to production. So the workflow can be as simple as you want or as complex as you want. It depends on your business needs. When it's time to actually deploy your code, we have also a serverless service, so no virtual machines to manage, no, nothing to patch, nothing to install, to deploy your code. And we call that AWS Code Deploy. It's a service that takes a deployment script and will deploy your code either to AWS, like EC2 instance, Lambda function, containers, or on-premises. Uh, if you install a small agent on your machines on-premises, Code Deploy can also deploy code on-premises. So you can make a synchronized deployment between your cloud infrastructure and your on-premises uh, infrastructure. But best of that, Code Deploy is able to roll back a deployment and come back to the previous version of your code if something is going wrong. Uh, for example, we do support Canary deployment. A canary deployment is we, we launch V2 and we send a percentage of the traffic on V2. And then you have to define metrics to monitor the behavior of that V2. If everything goes well after a period of time, we are going to shift the, the entire traffic to the V2. If the monitoring is bad, then we are just going to stop sending traffic to V2 and let the traffic go to V1. 
Anyone knows why we call that a canary deployment? It comes back from the ancient time of the mine, uh, of the, the, the people uh, getting coal in, in, in the mine, because you know that one of the dangers for miners was to be exposed to gas that can kill them. So they took the habit to take a bird with them in a cage, and uh, the, the bird is much more sensitive than human to this uh, uh, gas risk. So if something happened to the bird, it was a signal for the men to actually leave the, the coal mine. So no animal has been hurt using code deployed here. Um, so that's the graphical explanation of what I did, uh, what I just uh, said. You release, you, you have your V1 code, your V2 code, you send 10% of the traffic, you observe the result, and if everything goes well, uh, you send 100% of the, of the traffic. Uh, we can do also something called blue-green deployment. Blue-green deployment, um, it's a bit different, because you are going to manually send traffic for some of your tester. So you have your V1 infrastructure, let's call it the blue infrastructure. Here we have a load balancer, and we have a bunch of container running in the cloud, that's the V1. Um, a blue-green deployment, the code deploy service will create a green environment, your V2, with a new load balancer, so a different address, and will deploy some uh, tasks, some containers over there. Um, because it's a different address, the shift of traffic is not made automatically. You have to send your customer, some of your beta customer or prime customer, whatever, to that new address so that they actually can, can test uh, that. And you decide how much time you are going to expose this customer to the green version. By monitoring the green version, if everything goes well, after a period of time, we just change the old load balancer to send the traffic to the green version. And so at that time, 100% of your traffic will receive the, 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 the service from the new version, V2, and at that time, we can safely delete the old environment and just pretend it never existed uh, again. So blue-green, very important. What type of metrics to, to observe when, when you are doing that? Um, many of you are tempted by using only technical metrics, like the number of HTTP 500 errors you would receive or HTTP 400 error. That's a good idea. But I strongly advise you also to monitor some kind of business metric. For example, Netflix. You know, Netflix, they know at any moment of the day the number of persons that are going to, play the, to, to press the play button on their user interface. They know how many people are starting to stream per country and per moment of the day. When they are doing a deployment, they are observing that metric. And if that metric falls down, it's not because customers do not want to, to start watching TV anymore. No, it's because something in the new deployment is actually broken. And they use that metric to say, hey, if the metric falls down for more than, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 person, then automatically we roll back to the old version. We are doing the same at Amazon. We know at every moment of the day on each market how many people are buying stuff from Amazon.com. When we are deploying something, if we have that metric that goes down, it means something is broken in a deployment. When something is broken in a deployment, the first rule is to roll back and then to investigate and to search the, the, the root cause. So combine technical metrics and uh, business metrics when you are uh, deploying your new version of your software. So let's show you a demo. I have roughly 10 minutes left to uh, show you um, a demo. I have a project here on, uh, Git, on GitHub, which is a very, very simple website hosted in a container. Um, I have the website here. It's a very boring bootstrap uh, template. These containers are deployed in a service that, um, oops, in a service, where am I here? Okay. In a service called uh, Elastic um, uh, Container Services, ECS. So it's a service that runs Docker container in, in the cloud. And you see I have one cluster across multiple availability zone, uh, across multiple uh, data center here. That has one Nginx, that's my web server, uh, one service active. And this service has been defined to run two containers in two different data centers at any moment of the day. You see that I have my version 28 currently running there. 
The service will provide me a load balancer automatically. The service will also monitor my container. If one of these containers die for whatever reason, it might be a hardware problem on our side or something inside your container, the service will detect that and will replace that container automatically. I just reload here and you see I have a new container which is currently being provisioned. It just takes a few seconds to provision. It will then switch to pending and switch to running. And because uh, the load balancer is integrated with that, if I reload this page, as a customer, I still receive a, a page because the load balancer knows that one of my containers died and he stopped sending traffic to that container. The new container will automatically register to the, the, the service. So it's totally, that type of failure is totally transparent for, for your uh, customer. And voila, now I have my two services running again. Um, I also have a pipeline, a deployment pipeline, which is uh, configured here. Um, this tool is a workflow. It's called Code Pipeline. And it's the workflow that allows you to start from any type of event, but typically a change on GitHub, on Bitbucket, or the, the Git repository that you can host inside AWS. And then it's a sequence of different steps to execute whenever there is a change in the source code. Uh, my first step is to build my application. My second step is to deploy deploy that application to the cluster. Building, it's just a simple script, which is in the source code. It's called build spec. It's a YAML file with a sequence of build command for different phase. So we have a pre-built phase, a post-built phase, a build phase. You can run pretty much whatever you want there. So these commands will execute inside code build. And you can here uh, see I'm just logging to my Docker image repository. I'm starting a Docker build, a Docker tag to assign a tag to my, to my uh, new build and pushing the new image to the, the Docker repository. That's pretty much for my build. The deployment phase is taken by uh, ECS and ECS has a file called a task definition. So a task, it's just an instance of a Docker uh, container. Basically, it defines everything you put on the Docker run uh, command line, like uh, where to put the log files, what is the port mapping, uh, what are the environment variables. And any change into that will generate a task definition on ECS, which is uh, immutable. You cannot change that later. So it has a version. Here I'm at version 28. Let's make a change, and let's try to build version uh, 29. So the rest of the demo will be quite fast, actually, because I'm going to change the source code of that application, going to push that into GitHub. We are going to verify that it's indeed there in, in GitHub. And we are going to see the code pipeline uh, workflow trigger from, from the GitHub change. It will build a new container that takes one or two minutes and will deploy that. The deployment will be progressive, so we are not going to kill the two existing containers and replace them because that would break your service for the period of deployment. The customer would not be able to connect to the service anymore. So instead, um, ECS will create two new versions of the Docker container, version 29 in this case, We'll wait for this container to boot properly and to register to the load balancer to pass a couple of health checks. And when everything is okay, then uh, ECS will kill the old version of the container. And all that will happen automatically. I can keep my hands there off of the keyboard and we'll see the progress as uh, it, is, it is going. I'm spending a bit of time to explain what's, what's going to happen because once I trigger the change in GitHub, I'm not controlling anything. Everything will, will be automated and everything will be in sequence automatically. So I'm going to my code. Um, one of the things I don't like here, how much time do I have? Four minutes, OK. Um, one of the things I don't like here is the gray color. It's quite sad and depressing to see that gray color. So I will change the color to something uh, more flashy, to really flashy. So the gray color is 777. I make a search and replace of that. Um, I'm going to quickly verify my change here locally. So I'm building locally and running it locally just to be sure that my change is good, like every single developer should do. Oops. And yes, that's the website with a flashy color. It's the Amazon Orange. We can really spot the difference between this and uh, this. So let's stop my local uh, Docker. Uh, I'm using Visual Studio to, to do my git add, git commit, and git push. But what I'm really doing here through the user interface, it's exactly the same as git add, no, git commit. I'm putting a demo, uh, 
um, a commit message, like my, my grandma told me to always put a commit message in your, in your Git. So let's commit that. And then push to uh, GitHub. So if everything goes well, and I'm going back to GitHub here, to the ECS demo, and reloading that page, you see that there is a change 30 seconds ago. So the change arrived on, on GitHub. So now I'm going back to my pipeline. And you see that the source code phase has been already executed. Of course, there is nothing to do there. Just download. It has been executed just now. And right now, it's in the build phase. So the build phase takes one or two minutes, because we are creating a Docker container for the build environment itself. And then uh, we are going to download the, the source code that has been taken out of GitHub and execute my build spec.yaml file, the file that I show you. If you want to look at the details there, you can always see the details of the build. So we have a, a console that gives you a full access to the log. So you can see the log progressing. You can tell the log. Right now, it's still in progress. There is a bit of, it's asynchronous. So there might be a few seconds delay before you can see the log appearing, uh, appearing there. But eventually, <laughs> the log will appear. It seems very, very long when I'm in front of an audience <laughs> doing a demo. In real life, it's, it's, it's much more uh, manageable. Uh, yeah, you see the logs are there. It's pulling the Docker from the Docker layer. It's building my container, pushing to the Docker repository. And look at the last line here. That's the line I prefer. It's succeed. So the build phase succeed. I have a new image, a new version of my uh, Docker container, which is now or should be available in my Docker uh, repository. So the pipeline will uh, very soon detect that the build is finished. It's pulling the system every uh, now and then. And it will go to the next phase, which is uh, deploy. So the build should stop and well, uh, succeed, and now going to, to the deploy phase. So the deploy will create two new instances of my container on the container services. So if I reload this, you see that now I have three and four containers. I have two that are running in uh, version 28, and I have two that are provisioning in version 29. In a very short moment of time, these two new container will become running as well. And as soon as they are running, they, are will, they will be registered to the load balancer, and the load balancer will start to serve their contents. So what I'm doing on my live version right now is refresh that page. And you see that as the containers are coming to life, the load balancer will start to balance some of the customer requests. Hey, this is the first one to the new version. But right now, my old version is still there as well. So if I keep continuing refreshing that page, I have some hits on the old version, some hits on the new version. And this is just for the time to ensure that the new version is healthy. When we know that the new version is healthy, we are going to drain existing connection to the old one. Draining means waiting for the TCP connection to terminate. Here I can continue because my, my TCP connection are very short, but we don't want to interrupt permanent connection, like imagine if you have a web socket or something like that. And as soon as there is no more connection to the old version, the cluster will automatically terminate the two container. And apparently, it's done now, because I keep pressing refresh, 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 and now I just have the new version there. So if I'm going back here and refresh, you will see, yep, I have only two container of version 29. So this is containers running on ECS. ECS is a, a cloud service to run your container inside the cloud uh, without any virtual machines. It's, it's really serverless. You don't need to provision any operating system or to patch the operating system or to install Docker. You just tell the service, hey, Mr. ECS or Mrs. ECS, can you please run 10 containers with a load balancer in front of you and, and monitor that, that for me? So that's a serverless execution environment for um, your uh, Docker container. So that's the key takeaway from uh, this talk. Um, when you're working in the cloud, any cloud, please manage your infrastructure as code. Never, never, never connect to the console and do snowflake change to your infrastructure. Always version control, not only your application, but also your infrastructure, your data center. Try to build and to integrate your code as much as you can, as quickly as you can. 
and release in production as fast as you can as well, because this is the only place where your code is bringing you added value. The only place where code is bringing added value to your customer is when it's live into production. Don't keep code running in GitHub or staying in GitHub.